for future viewing. So let's start the recording now and you may see a pop up that you need to say continue. Welcome to everyone for tonight's Master Gardening's presentation on summer vegetable gardening. My name is Lauren Paws, and I will be moderating the Zoom presentation tonight. We ask that you use the Zoom chat box directed to everyone for questions, and I will relay all questions to the speaker at the end of the presentation. Do not adjust chats to the presenters because they are busy presenting, obviously. We will have approximately 15 minutes of allotted time at, um, after the presentation. We will also post the link to the University of Arizona where the recording and PowerPoint of this presentation can be found in a few days. Tonight's presentation is courtesy of the University of Arizona. We are Master Gardener volunteers for the Yavapai County Cooperative Extension, which is the outreach arm of the University of Arizona College in Agricultural Life and Agriculture and Life Sciences. Master gardeners are trained by the University of Arizona and we provide science-based horticultural information to the public by staffing horticultural helplines in both Camp Verde and Prescott Extension offices, as well as by presenting talks like we are doing tonight. Yavapai County currently has over 200 active Master Garden volunteers. We are planning our next presentation on Wednesday, May 26th at 6.30 p.m. on growing and producing table grapes in the Prescott area by Rich Peterson. Also, stay tuned to presentations on grafting, rainwater harvesting, pollinators, winter vegetable gardening, and more in the future. With that, hmm. let me introduce tonight's presenter, Steve McIntyre. Steve is an Emeritus Master Gardener and a volunteer for the UA Cooperative Extension Help Desk in Prescott. He and his wife, Diane, are both avid gardeners. Steve focuses on vegetable gardening and seed saving, while Diane is the perennial gardener. Steve is one of our go-to presenters. You may remember him from a prior Zoom presentation on container gardening last year. He told me his motto is, have easel, will travel, and I will hold him to that. <laughs> okay, Steve, the mic is yours. <laughs> well, let's start with a good laugh. <laughs> oh, well, good evening, everyone. Here's my uh, perfunctory next slide. And on here, I think very important thing is the, uh, the two uh, ways that you can get a hold of the help desk, both uh, over in Camp Verde and in Prescott, telephone numbers, and of course, uh, email addresses. But let's start about, let's start talking about what we're going to be doing this evening. What are we going to be talking about? Well, all sorts of good stuff. And it's going to be kind of a rock and roll fast breeze through. So uh, uh, take notes and, and uh, if you have questions, uh, we will do our best to to answer them but i'm going to try to cover a lot of things here um where to put your garden uh, fencing for your garden soil preparation uh growing seasons we'll talk about spring growing and and summer growing uh we're actually going to take a little detour and talk about tomato basics just kind of as a review um we'll have a screen that talks about pests what to do about them, diseases. And then my favorite, absolute favorite is watching your garden grow. What I enjoy doing best, I think. With that, let's start with, this is gonna be vegetable gardening, summer vegetable garden. Well, where? Where do, where, where, where do you wanna put a garden? Probably the most important thing is, is you wanna have at least six hours six hours of, of good sunlight. If you have a preference, uh, six hours starting in the morning uh, so that you avoid the very hot afternoon sun. Probably the second very interesting, very important thing is to have it be able to fence it. Uh, there's all sorts of critters out there that would love to, to uh, munch on the things that you've been working so hard to for yourself. That is uh, your garden vegetables. Uh, avoid windy. Uh, good luck, as we very much know here in April and so far in May. 
Um, so let's just see what we might want to do here. Along with where are you going to put your garden? Well, in what? Uh, in ground. There's the garden and my garden of uh, several uh, several summers ago. It uh, is not very cultivated. That really is grass that you can see there. A horse trough is another way of uh, growing vegetables. And down here at the uh, lower left-hand corner is uh, YEI, the YEI garden cart. YEI is a local operation that make these wonderful garden carts. Uh, you'll see that there's uh, wheels on this particular garden cart, but if, in reality, if that's full of all sorts of um, compost and, and soil and things of that sort, plus the water, it probably weighs 200 pounds. So I'm not too sure if uh, I will ever use it uh, with the wheels attached. Fencing is important. Um, probably of all the things that you want to try to exclude from your garden is deer and javelina. Javelina probably are the, the, the one that uh, um, is, is very important. Uh, javelina can just ruin just about anybody's garden almost uh, overnight, if not faster. Exclusion, how do you do it? A good sturdy fence will do it. Um, in addition to actually having the a good sturdy fence, but you want to bury it. Um, both deer and javelina, if they can get their snout underneath that fence, uh, they're in your garden. So it's important that you not only have a good sturdy fence above ground, but also uh, consider uh, actually burying. I, I actually use um, uh, poultry knitting, chicken wire, and have that buried uh, outside of my, uh, my exclusion fence. Interesting thing about deer. Uh, deer don't like to have anything over their head. And, and it, it seems that one of the things you can do, if you only have a four foot fence, which the deer wouldn't take much to get over that as you might well imagine, but if you had a strand of streamers at about the eight foot level or six foot level, the deer will look up at that and they just don't want to go underneath it. And that seems to work pretty well. If you have a real problem with deer, you just might try that um, just as a sort of an add on. Rabbits, raccoons, squirrels, yeah, they, they, uh, they, 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 they'll, they, they'll find a way to your garden if, if, you, if you don't have it fenced off somehow or caged as these may be. How about putting vegetables in a different place? Um, this whole idea of the COVID growing your own, uh, we've got this grow your own Prescott that I'm involved with where individuals are growing their own vegetables and they're, they're seeking out places that they can put their, their new gardens. Well, if you've got an existing garden, say an annual flower garden, uh, consider uh, making some space for uh, for your vegetables in there. This particular picture kind of looks like they might be the real stinky um, so-called French marigolds. And they're wonderful for keeping the aphids, keeping aphids away from uh, what you might be growing. So there's, there's a benefit, not only just to open up your uh, regular garden that you're cultivating to vegetables, but also uh, they can actually can be used to, to, to help grow your vegetables. Soil preparation. It's easy with a container garden or, or a raised flower bed. Um, my, everybody seems to have their kind of favorite mix. And my very favorite uh, mix is, is a 50-50 mix of native soil and bag planter mix or compost or, or something like that. The reason I like native soil is because that's where all the good stuff hides. That's where the fungi is and the bacteria and things of that sort. And you want that. You want that fungi and bacteria in your garden because that is part of the decomposition that goes on and, and it's, it's important that you keep your, your soil alive. 
So you mix it together, uh, you irrigate it, let it settle, break it, and, and you're ready to go. Now, substituting things like, um, oh, um, garden loam or something like that certainly would be another way. And you may or may not be sterile to begin with, although I have seen more than just a few great huge piles of, of garden loam and it's been out there for the better part of six months and there's not a weed in it that kind of tells you what you know that's pretty sterile very possibly very sterile kind of medium and and uh, the reason again that i like the idea of mixing uh, in my native soil soil map all right where are we um, Prescott, Sedona, blah, 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 so forth and so on. Um, if you really zero in on this soil map of Arizona, you can kind of get a, a general idea of what is the soil like. And Prescott primarily is, is sandy soil. Uh, a lot of that, I think, has to do with our surroundings. Um, where I am here in Prescott, I can see uh, off of the... Uh, off to the west, uh, Granite Mountain. And uh, as a consequence, uh, my uh, soil and a lot of Prescott is, is, uh, is, is quite sandy. Prescott Valley and Chino Valley is, is clay soil. Um, and there's a different sort of thing you want to do to clay soils versus sandy soil. Sedona is kind of a, a mix, a mix of both. Uh, I've got to share this with you. This, this is a book that um, it's still in the library, but why it's kind of interesting uh, is, is that uh, when my wife and I first came to Prescott, now a number of years ago, 12, 13 years ago, one of the things we did is to uh, stop by the, uh, the public library and just to get an idea of, of um, you know, what it was like. Diane disappeared over to uh, the uh, the desk and they inquired about, well, what kind of volunteer operate, um, well, your volunteers, what kind of opportunities do you have? And I went into the stacks and the gardening section and I was going through and going through and all of a sudden I've, I, I spotted this little book and I pulled it out. Here it is. The title of it is Gardening and Granite. Now, if that isn't a precursor to what we really have here in, in Prescott, I don't know what it is. Uh, we ignored it and we've been here and, and enjoyed uh, the area ever since. But gardening and granite, yeah. Okay, what can we do? Sandy soils, gardening and granite. Uh, the goal here is you want to increase the water and the nutrient holding. Um, as many of people that garden here, gardening and granite, here in Prescott know, uh, water just goes right through and when you irrigate. And, and of course, that means the nutrients are just flowing through. So you want to find a way of slowing down that, that, that uh, water and the nutrient. And the way you can do it is by, by adding organic material that is naturally absorbs moisture, absorbs water and the, as the nutrients. Uh, peat moss, uh, spaghetti moss is peat moss. That is uh, composted manure, hay, fish, uh, wood chips, things of that sort. There's also a, a product that is man-made, actually manufactured, and that's called uh, vermiculite. Uh, vermiculite over here comes usually in bags, and it is um, um, engineered, we'll say, uh, to absorb water. So the idea is you, you mix the vermiculite, which just sort of looks like, oh, I don't know, it's, it's very small. It's bigger than a lima bean, but it's, it, you mix it. You mix it in with your uh, existing soil. And because it absorbs moisture, uh, it is a way of uh, slowing down and, and uh, the evaporation or the, the, uh, the water itself as it, as it goes through. So that's one man-made thing that you can do, uh, plus the, the organic ways of doing it. Uh, now, the next thing 
is just the opposite. Clay soils like we have in, in Chino Valley and, and, um, and Prescott Valley. The goal there is to increase the porosity, to improve the aeration and to improve the, improve the depth drainage. Um, I was involved with a community garden uh, in, in Prescott Valley a number of years ago. And we, we thought, let's, let's check out the soil. And so we did, and somebody found a, a shovel and we uh, dug a small hole and poured maybe a gallon of water in there. And we waited and we waited and the water didn't go down. And that really said, yeah, that's a real clay of soil. It really does hold the water. So what can you do to fix that? Or try to fix it. Same kind of thing. Uh, the, the idea is you want to open up the, the spacing between the, the, the grains of, of soil. And, and, and uh, clay is very, very, uh, if you, if you uh, let it dry out, you'll see that it really is, is very fine. So you want to open it up, uh, open up the, the, the space, we'll say. Uh, of this, peat moss is still one of the things we could use. Um, there's a product called uh, perlite. Perlite is uh, one of the things that um, people that are doing um, oh, hydro hydroponics, people that are doing hydroponics, this is one of the things that they use. As a consequence, um, you can buy a lot of perlite for, for a pretty reasonable price. And it sort of looks like, oh, I don't know, it sort of looks like uh, styrofoam that's been all chopped up, but that's not what it is. The idea is you want to make room, make room uh, between the components of your soil, of your, of your clay soil to make, to make uh, uh, air and, and also for better drainage. Now, you can also, they say, use sand. <laughs> what happens that when you put uh, clay plus sand, plus straw and you bake it, hey, you get adobe bricks. So be careful, don't put small sand if you put any sand in. Use what they call large grain sand. Uh, probably perlite is a, a safer thing to use. All right, this is a picture that I'm gonna show you the real thing. This is something that uh, the master gardeners uh, learned uh, in one of our classes, and it's a way of judging, a way of judging what kind of soil you have. So what you do, I'm gonna try to get up here. This is actually soil that we took out, uh, we uh, planted last yesterday, we planted our, so this is actually from my garden. And you put a little bit of water in it, and so it, 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 it's moist. But I want you to, to notice that what happens, what happens when you sort of just kind of nudge it? Look at this. It all breaks apart and falls down on my keyboard. <laughs> so this, this is what you're looking for. You can try this uh, in your own garden. Now, if it's clay, it's not going to fall apart like this. Uh, if it is sandy, uh, it'll, it'll just, it won't even be able to do this kind of a thing. So uh, believe it or not, there's probably a half dozen, a half dozen um, uh, YouTube videos on just this that goes through the, uh, the idea of taking a handful of your soil and judging for yourself what kind of soil you have. Yeah, you really don't need a, a map, a map, a soil map of the area. So give it a try. All right, what to grow? Probably one of the most useful things that you can get from the extension. Uh, this is the uh, um, our extension in well in the Birdie Valley and also here. Um, it is a Yavapai County uh, Cooperative Extension Bulletin Number Fifty One. This is bulletin number 51. Now you can see it right over here. Uh, but bulletin number 51. This is a planting guide 
at different elevations. So you can actually read this right here. It says pole beans and here at the elevation of around 6,000 feet is May 15th through July 1st. This is just, I think, an invaluable um, bulletin, bulletin number 51 that, that uh, you can get through the extension. There are two major growing times, we'll call it. Uh, the cool weather or the cool season is uh, for, for here in, in, in the Prescott area and, and the Arizona Highlands is in the spring and again in the fall. Um, and then in between that, of course, we have the warm weather. A lot of that goes by what the soil temperature is. Now, also, the, the elevation of the sun makes a difference and things of that sort. But I think the soil temperature is probably one of the main factors. Cool is in the low, well, high 50s and the low 60s, something like that. Uh, warm weather is, is from mid-May about now. Um, and temperatures uh, greater than, than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. A, um, uh, it's very popular now to, to uh, if you're barbecuing or, or roasting, whatever, is, is you use one of these digital thermometers for instant reads. Um, that is a wonderful thing to use in your soil to determine what your soil temperature is. And, and uh, let's now go to the, an idea of, well, what can you plant when? How to grow it. The cool season, this is the spring and the fall, um, roots, radishes, turnips. Um, since you're growing roots, you, you want a direct seed. That is, you're going to be putting the seed into the ground directly. Get the seed packet, flip it over, uh, follow the instructions. Typically, it's quarter inch deep, something like that. Um, if, you, if you're putting in carrots, which is, of course, a, a, a root crop, the seed is so tiny, I just sort of spread it out and then cover it over for the prescribed amount, which is a quarter inch or thereabouts. And then when they, uh, the actual uh, seeds have germinated, that's when you go out and you actually to get the, the spacing, probably for carrots, I don't know, two inches, something like that. Again, look at the back of the pack of, of seeds and you get a general idea of, of um, how, how to grow it. Greens is another cool season. Um, kale, lettuce, mustard, things of that sort. Uh, I've been successful in growing um, um, lettuce. Uh, you know, I'll remember what it is in just a moment. Uh, arugula, Diane shouts in the other room. Arugula. I've got a picture somewhere of when it had snowed here. And, and I have one of the, the YEI garden carts. And the, it, it had a certain amount, a certain amount of snow on it. And I sort of dug down, and then I've got this picture of arugula sitting there in the middle of this pile of snow, and it had been growing well throughout the whole winter. So you really can stretch out the, the growing season, uh, which is another whole topic. What else can you grow? Warm season, big four, big four, eggplant, chili peppers, tomatoes, sweet peppers, things of that sort. Uh, those are the four, that is. Um, plants. Uh, yeah, you could plant seeds now, but it takes a lot of time to get the plants up to the point where you can actually, uh, you know, they have some structure to them. I started uh, eggplant in December. Give you an idea of how long it takes uh, to grow these, uh, the big four, to grow them, the tomatoes, uh, peppers, things of that sort. Uh, you certainly can buy uh, plants at, at this point in time. And, and um, so the warm season, these particular plants, the big four, uh, put out in, in plants. Uh, you, you're really kind of, uh, it's a lost cause to try to grow them from, uh, in my opinion, uh, from seed at this time. Uh, how about the cucurbits? Uh, these are the, your, your squash, uh, uh, pumpkins, cucumbers, watermelon, things of that sort. Um, plants or direct seed, but here 
get out that uh, barbecue thermometer and check your soil because you really have to have it up in the at least low 70s. If you were to try to right now to start your summer squash and you've got this perfect place for it, it's all cultivated, it's ready to go, and you plant, it's just the seed is just going to sit there and it'll, it'll just essentially rot. And it, it, it um, so uh, oftentimes I'll have a race. Every year I'll have a race because I'll have, I'll have um, seeds. I, I save my seed forever. And I'll have pumpkin seeds or, or cucumber seeds that, well, they're about seven years old now. And I want to test them out to see if they're okay. And it's a very easy way of doing that. Uh, in a, a, a paper towel, just um, moisten it, put your seed down there and put it in a warm place. It doesn't have to have light to, to germinate. And so, yeah, seed seven years old, but I can't throw it away. So I will plant it in a pot or something like that. And invariably I'll end up with uh, uh, a, a pretty good size plant of say a a cucumber plant, something like that. And I'll, I'll put them both into the garden at the, at the same time that I actually plant the seed. Guess what? <laughs> the seed always seems to win. Uh, they'll grow well, but if you were to time it to the time, to the point where you first, um, where you first uh, got some fruit off of the, uh, off of the uh, cucumber, uh, it, it's, as I said, it, it, the, the seed usually wins, but uh, that's just things that I enjoy doing as far as having um, uh, fun, fun with your seeds and, and that sort of thing. Okay, let's rush through tomatoes. Very basically, there is the, the determinate tomato and the indeterminate tomato. It's kind of an interesting uh, story that goes about the, the uh, determinate. Um, Rutgers University, which is New Jersey, I think, Rutgers Univer University uh, was tasked, probably a government contract, uh, to try to solve a problem that the New Jersey um, farmers were having, the tomato farmers. And that is, uh, they had the problem of 40 acres, 40 acres of tomatoes and all over here, the north part of it was getting, uh, maybe half of that was ripening. And this is what they used to be, the early 1940s or late 30s, I guess. And, and they were growing primarily, the, well, they were growing the indeterminate fine type of, of tomatoes. They weren't getting all ripe at the same time. And of course, that's what a farmer wants, is to be able to clear the field. And so Rutgers was tasked with coming up with a tomato that the whole 40 acres would, would um, produce at the same time, ripen at the same time. So they produced the determinate tomatoes. As a matter of fact, you can still buy uh, Rutgers tomatoes. Uh, it's actually considered a, a, an heirloom. Um, and the idea is that it produces sort of right now, produces right here. And you get lots of tomatoes off of your vines, but the problem is, is that the production quickly tapers off. And, and so uh, it, the, the other benefit though, is that you get early production. You'll get that ripe tomato and maybe you'll win the, <laughs> the neighborhood um, first tomato prize or something like that. But if you want tomatoes over a long period of time, you really want to grow the indeterminate or vine type of, of tomato because they produce over a long period of time. Really, they, they produce uh, up until uh, the frost. Heirloom tomatoes, my favorite, absolute my favorite. Uh, at the Master Gardener um, sort of in-house uh, tomato sale that we had, there were a lot of heirloom tomatoes by, um, plants going there. Uh, these are mostly vine type, indeterminate. Um, they're what they call open pollinated, or I guess you might call it 
natural. Uh, you can save the seed and um, and uh, use it the next year. Hybrid tomatoes. Hybrid tomatoes are not GMO. And there's a wild big difference between the two. Uh, GMO, of course, uh, it stands for genetically modified organisms, GMO. Anyway, hybrid tomatoes go back lots of years and it is a, a controlled pollination that preserves certain traits that are, are beneficial. Um, some of them are very resistant to uh, diseases, whereas the heirloom are not necessarily uh, resistant to, to much of the normal tomato problems. Um, actually, my brother sent me a list of um, open pollinated heirloom tomatoes that have some, they have some resistance. And I'm sure that if you did a, a search, uh, internet search for, uh, I don't know, disease resistant uh, heirloom tomatoes, you probably get that, that same list. And it, it, uh, it might be beneficial to you. Now, um, because these are hybrid tomatoes, if you save the seed, you really don't know what you're going to get if you use that seed the next year. Um, so that that is just one of the, the caveats, I guess we'll call it. Fertilizer. Fertilizer is good. Uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, there were three things that I don't know where it came from, but I'm glad they do it. Uh, the the um, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are listed on the uh, package of your fertilizer. Uh, and then this is this is percentage by weight, percentage by weight. And and uh, any even even um, even well, just to let me said that all fertilizers, it must be a federal requirement or something. Uh, but here is the really interesting thing. What does that MPK mean? We know it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, yes, but what does it do? Nitrogen is for healthy fo uh, foliage. Uh, this is primarily, uh, if you look at phosphorus here, yeah, strong roots and it does make uh, cell force and feist diseases, but really strong roots is, is one of the, the things that it does. Some people uh, will actually put uh, phosphorus, uh, granular phosphorus, uh, when they are planting, putting out things like, uh, well, we, uh, Diane and I were planting um, eggplant and, um, and uh, not chilies, but uh, peppers uh, uh, yesterday. And I actually put uh, a little bit of something called triple phosphate, which is, well, it, it's about that much. It's sort of a, poof, you throw in the hole and then and then uh, um, irrigate it so that it all is all uh, it all mixed up and, and it goes into the soil itself. Um, continuing on, what is what is uh, potassium? And, and the idea is the phosphorus is going to help uh, produce uh, really strong roots. Uh, potassium is for hardy growth, uh, things of that sort. Generally, uh, a, a NPK of equal value, like a 10-10-10, is, is it just kind of a general purpose. Um, there's a cautionary thing about nitrogen and tomatoes, which I'll get to before we leave this session. Uh, organic fertilizers, uh, yeah, it's from animals or vegetables or, or that sort. Uh, most of them are slow release uh, because the form that you put into the hole is not the form that the plant can use. Um, that's a little complicated. I'm not really going to go in there too, but, but here is uh, organic, certainly blood is, is uh, very organic. Um, and uh, alfalfa pellets, look at the, uh, the NPK there. Uh, it's pretty balanced, three, two, two. Um, horse manure that is composted now. Um, it is also balanced uh, nitrogen and in the phosphorus and, and so forth, but look at very low values. And really the reason that I like using um, composted horse manure is because of what the horse ate. It has all of that um, hay that's in there. Uh, caution though, uh, 
check out the the heritage of the the hay that the horse is that your neighbor's horse is eating. Uh, the reason for that is is uh, elderly horses evidently uh, are often fed um, often fed um, hay that is Bermuda Bermuda grass Bermuda grass hay, and of course it goes right through the horse, and you the the, the actual seeds will end up in the the manure and and you use that on your garden uh yeah you're going to get a lot of bermuda grass and you don't want that in your garden so i uh very careful we have a lot of horses around here i quiz the uh, the owner on well what kind of hay do you feed your horse and uh, i'm very selective uh, again organic fertilizers uh, inorganic fertilizers. Inorganic would be, uh, yeah, there are the time release, which is good. Uh, urea, I guess that's for lawns. Uh, I've never had a lawn, so I'm not too sure what that's for. Maybe you can put that in the chat box. Oh, there's that triple phosphate. And notice the, the NPK on that, 0, 0.45, 0. It's, it's, it is just the, uh, just the phosphorus. And, uh, and we'll see how it how it actually, uh, if it does indeed help, should help. All right, we're getting toward the end. And and uh, let me just sort of slide through these. Uh, guess what? You're going to attract all sorts of uh, interlopers in the way of pests, uh, insects uh, into your into your vegetable garden. Uh, aphids, thrips, uh, squash bugs, blister beetle, blah, 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 lots of different things. Take a look at the non-chemical treatment that we have right here. Uh, soap spray. Soap spray in different viscosities does a lot of work on these, these pests. Um, here, let's see, do I have, yeah, at the very bottom here, uh, number two, uh, a teaspoon, it's, it's very light in, in the uh, amount of, of soap that you put into it. A pint of water and a teaspoon, one teaspoon of detergent. Uh, that's good for the aphids, thrips, things of that sort. Squash bugs, my real nemesis. I, I, I picked this up from Rich Peterson, who um, is a um, farmer's market provider. And he's going to be on... I guess next month. And what he uses on squash bugs is what I'll call a heavy duty uh, soap spray. It is four teaspoons of detergent to the pint of water. So it is much more thick. It is a heavy duty spray. It works. Um, yeah, you're killing off an insect. Uh, yeah, but don't forget it's you or the insect, and which is it going to be? It gets down to those sort of basics. I want to win because I want that squash. And with a squash bug, you just, psh, psh, psh. and uh, what you're actually doing there in all the cases here with these soap sprays, you're essentially covering the insect so it, it, can't, it, it can't breathe, in other words. That's okay. It's, like I said, it's you or the, or the insect. There are chemical ways of, um, of controlling aphids and the squash bugs and the beetles. Uh, Carborol is the main ingredients in, um, in uh, seven, a very popular um, non-organic chemical. Uh, careful when you use seven. Um, if you have to use it, don't use it when there's any bees out. Uh, it'll, 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 it doesn't take much of that, uh, that carborol to, to kill off uh, quite a few bees. So I, I try to stay away from that. Soap sprays. Plant diseases. Yeah, yeah, powdery mildew, curly leaf. Oh, gosh. Powdery mildew is somewhat prevalent here during the monsoon season because it'll be 85 degrees. Long comes the monsoon and the temperature drops and the humidity goes up. Guess what? That's wonderful for, for, for powdery, powdery mildew. But there is a way of getting rid of it. Look down here. We'll call it the Master Gardener fungicide. 
uh, one tablespoon of baking powder, one tablespoon of salt, gallon of water, but you use it. Make as much as you need. I've forgotten why it turns green or something. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good reason for, for using it all up. Curly leaf virus is a little more uh, of interest in the sense that um, it, it always, we always get calls um, in the uh, September and or August time frame about somebody, their tomato overnight just kind of wilts. And oftentimes it's the curly leaf virus. Uh, it is it is a spread, vectored, spread by the cucumber beetle. And the, the problem is that um, it can go from one plant and the beetle can go over to the next plant, infect it. And, and the hard thing is that there's something called uh, Fusarium wilt, which also uh, has the detrimental look that you, overnight almost that your, your plant can, your tomato plant will just, well, the melons for that matter, beets, cucumbers, there's a long list of things that uh, are, but the symptoms are the same between the, the virus and, and the, the uh, Fusarium wilt, which is a fungi. It's a soil borne fungi. Um, you can get rid of it. You can get rid of it by uh, what's called uh, oh, solar, solar. What you do is you throw plastic all over it, uh, your infected area, and you get it good and hot. And that's that's what will kill off the fungi. But uh, hopefully uh, you will not have to, to worry about that. All right. Watching your garden grow. As I said, this is my most favorite time. Obviously, mulching. Mulching is uh, dramatically reduces the need for, for water. Um, there's the one inch rule. And believe it or not, <laughs> this actually, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> the one inch rule is very scientific in that uh, there's a bulletin that has been uh, written about how you actually test your soil. Basically, what it is, up to your first knuckle on your, your finger, if you can go down into the soil and it still is damp, and you know it's damp because it'll, it'll stick to your finger, you really don't need to water. If you come up and it's dry, then you do need to water. So that's the so-called one inch rule. And there's the two inch rule and the three inch rule, but I'll, I'll let you look that up. Um, fertilizing, all right, start fertilizing once the the crops begin, except for your tomatoes. Be mean to your tomatoes. Don't fertilize them. If you really, really have to fertilize your tomatoes, then get a tomato fertilizer, which has low in nitrogen and it has the, the other uh, ingredients in it. The idea here is that if you fertilize with nitrogen, your tomatoes, it'll green up and have lots of greenery but it doesn't necessarily produce any more tomatoes. It may actually produce less. And of course, be ever vigilant for, for bugs because <laughs> they'll be there, guaranteed. All right, what's the takeaway? What have I been talking about for the last, oh my gosh, 45 minutes. Um, sunlight, remember sunlight. Uh, morning sun is, if you have a choice, um, Mulching obviously can conserve water uh, or fertilizers for your garden can be organic or inorganic. There are two seasons, um, the cool and the warm. The cool actually is in the spring and, and again uh, in the fall. Uh, and as I uh, talked about here, uh, many garden pests can be, um, can be controlled with, with soap spray. Um, it's a rather laborious thing but I, I think it is probably the most, eh, call it humane, I guess. Uh, well, that seems to be somewhat contradictory, but I'm gonna leave that one alone. All right, so I think we are almost at the bottom of this. There we are, questions and comments. I will stop my share. I guess I'm gonna leave it up. You can go to the last slide, Steve. Yeah. Because right, we have one. to give...
kudos to the Cooperative Extension <laughs> in U of A. <laughs> yep, there it is. Um, I did post the website that we can get more information about the Master Gardening Program and where you can find the um, videos, uh, recordings of tonight's presentation um, right at the beginning of our chat box. And let me, I have several questions for you. So let me begin in consideration of time. Mary asked, would adding wood chips to soil cause nitrogen drain as they decompose? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's why you want to have it composted. Um, and to get there, wood chips um, is, when you throw it into um, uh, your native soil, or existing, say, uh, a compost pile, um, it is going to start decomposing. It needs nitrogen. It needs nitrogen to to um, to decompose if that actual um, actually happens. So yeah, you can you can hold you can suck nitrogen out of out of your garden, so to speak, by uh, by doing it that way. Okay. Now, if you use wood chips for mulch on the top, is that going to have the same effect? It like, will now putting mulch on the top. It is mulch, and it is not compost. Okay. And and uh, there's a lot of stories about that. But mulch, um, mulching with wood chips is, is certainly fine. And you can then use that and throw it into your compost pile once it has started the decomposition. Okay. Um, we couldn't see because your screen where your picture is when you were showing the book, we couldn't see it very well. And I know you said it was gardening in granite. Do you have the name of the author? Yeah. And I, yeah. I assume you bought that book and is that available <laughs> online? <laughs> no, no. It's, I'm going to have two, what, 12 years of, <laughs> no, gardening in granite, uh, compiled and published by the Prescott Garden Club. Okay. And it was, or club was, uh, this printing was a second printing in 1976. But the last time I looked, the book is still available. In the, and, and it's a fun book. Uh, it just has all sorts of good stuff in it. Uh, and it's all from the Prescott area. Okay. And then Bill asked, where's the best places to get bulk compost in the Quad City area? Assuming he doesn't have his own compost pile like all of us do. <laughs> uh, um, compost. Boy, I, 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 I've never bought compost, quite honestly, Bill. Um, can somebody else help me here? I, I make my own, so. Yeah. Well, you my, can... my daughter swears by um, mushroom compost. True, true. In the bag, but that's the only other resource I have. <laughs> Find a neighbor that has compost. Uh -oh. Okay. But again, if you're mixing it into your soil, make sure that it really is, is composted. Um, my question for you was with the cool weather um, uh, vegetables, do you use frost cloth on occasion at either at the end of the season or the beginning of the season? Oh yes, uh, certainly that is is a, a wonderful thing. Frost cloth um, is good because it'll let a fair amount of the sunlight through it. It's it's I don't know how opaque it is, but it, it's like seventy percent the sun will come through. Whereas you could use temporarily, uh, certainly just old sheets thrown over your for, for the night. The idea here is that. Um, when it's cold, you are the, the plants are warm and warm bodies radiate to cold bodies. And so the upper atmosphere is, is much colder than it is right down here on Earth. So by covering it up, you, you interrupt that flow. And, and um, so that, that's kind of the reason. But frost cloth does work. Um, and and uh, frost cloth give you typically about Oh, about two degrees of, of protection. And oftentimes that's enough. Um, just as a side, I used frost cloth this year on my strawberry bed. And mm. it I didn't produce any fruit, but all my plants lived through the winter, even with snow on top of them. It was a very heavy frost cloth. Yeah. And so when I took it off in spring, I mean, I already have a hundred 
uh, strawberries going right now, and it, oh. it was an immediate startup. So it was it really worked well for me. Um, question from Bill is: Do you start your seeds in December in a window or under lights? You can start you, to start the seeds uh, to get them to germinate. You just need a warm place. Um, top of a refrigerator works. Uh, I have what they call, oh, I don't know what they're called exactly, but they're, they're heat, heating pads. And they are right around 70 degrees. They have some kind of a um, onboard uh, thermostat on it. And um, typically it'll get up to the right temperature. Um, it, it, it varies. Um, um, Chili peppers and and uh, regular peppers, uh, sweet peppers is what I'm trying to say. They need an elevated temperature, probably up in the eh, 85 or so. Uh, tomatoes would germinate in the 70s, um, but then once they germinate, they need they need light, and that's where I think a uh, investment. If you're really interested in growing your own, an investment in one of these uh, four foot uh, fluorescent fixtures and and you can just get things like uh, inexpensive um, cool light you know you have fluorescent tubes there's there's the yellow i guess you would call it and the cool light um, for growing seeds you want the the cool temperature uh, for a little bit more money you can get the tubes that are actually uh, leds and they have a much broader spectrum of light and so you can use that for uh, both the growing of the seed and, and actually you could grow, um, you know, cucumbers uh, in your greenhouse for that matter. So yes, uh, once they're germinated, they need, if you can find a really, really um, sunny windowsill, that, that'll work. But lights are, I, I, I think lights are, if, if you're really interested, lights are, are worth the investment. And then um, I had a question. When you talked about the fungi wilt, um, yeah. it's in the soil. So does it stay in the soil to the next year? Do you have to replace your soil or does it disappear after the crops are gone? No, it does not disappear, unfortunately. Um, but you can get rid of it with uh, heat. Okay. And so I, it's called solaris, solaris, I think it's called sol, solarization. Okay. Especially what you do is the what you think is the affected area, uh, cover that with clear plastic, not black plastic, which is sort of counterintuitive, but you want clear plastic over it and then seal the periphery of your plastic. And um, probably you're going to want to leave it there for the better part of the summer, but it'll get that soil temperature up good and high. And that will supposedly that will uh, kill off um, the the, uh, the bacteria or the uh, the fungi. Okay. Um, yeah, Bill. Bill wanted to note you must have big library finds for having that granite gardening book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mary wanted to know: Do you make your own seed starting mix? Uh, no, I uh, I buy it is so. So I, I think it's Jiffy makes it. And you can buy this great huge bag for $4.96 or something like that. But you can reuse it. And the way you reuse it, you, you wouldn't want to reuse it without doing something to it. But you can do a heat process where let's, let's say you, you've used it and you've started seeds and now you've got them in pots and you want to start some more seed. Uh, the idea is, well, you know, there may be something in this seed starting mixture now. Well, um, what you want to do is put it into a big frying pan, a lid on it, and heat it up to about 165 degrees or so. And, and for about 20 minutes, it's, it's a kind of easy number like that. And that'll kill off any fungi that you have in your seed starting medium, and you can reuse it. But quite honestly, for what it costs for a big bag, I, I just as soon take my and put it into my, my uh, I always have a great huge container of, of uh, soil mix. So that's, uh, 
your choice, but yes, you can, you can reuse it. All right, that's it for the questions and um, a lot of kudos to you, Steve. We always enjoy your talks. Thank you. So, um, if there's nothing else, I'm gonna call it an evening. Thank